Hi and welcome back to my channel, Adventuring Mum and Borrowed Tum. My name is Lisa, it's lovely to see you here. If you are new, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Not only do you help me grow my channel, but it also makes sure that you don't miss out on any valuable content coming up. Today's video, as you can see from the title, is based on surrogacy expenses. Surrogacy expenses can be quite a taboo subject. It is quite often awkward to talk about expenses. However, it is vitally important that that is discussed as part of your journey. Now, generally, in a normal pregnancy, we wouldn't sit and think about how much it costs us to be pregnant. But there are a lot of costs involved that you wouldn't normally realise or take into consideration. So I'm hoping that this video is going to help put out there some of the different expenses that are claimed for during pregnancy, before pregnancy, during pregnancy and after pregnancy. So the general rule of thumb, or the best way to think of it, is that if you are experiencing any cost or expense due to being pregnant or related to the pregnancy, then that would be classed as a valid expense for surrogacy. So surrogates should never be out of pocket for carrying somebody else's baby. You know, pregnancy has a massive impact on the lives of surrogates. Not only do relationships sometimes suffer, sometimes our children can suffer. It can be quite a difficult process to go through as an individual. And of course, all of your friends and family are brought along on that journey with you. So ensuring that your surrogate's expenses are met is widely accepted and in fact essential. Um, at the parental order, at the end of your journey, CAFCAS will want to know that your surrogate's expenses have been paid. They will want to know that you have been looked after throughout the pregnancy and it is vital that you can pro prove that information. You do not have to provide a breakdown of those expenses to your intended parents. However, it is a good idea to keep a rough estimate in case it is needed for the parental order at the end of the journey. IPs will obviously have a choice as to whether or not they can afford those expenses. At the beginning of your journey, you will discuss with your IPs what your expenses are you will make an agreement as to when they will be paid, how often, how much, what percentage, and agreeing that all monies will be paid by the time that the baby is born. So let's take a look at some of those expenses, where they come from, what's involved, what can be included, and which part of the pregnancy they are related to. So the first part would be pre pregnancy expenses. So these are expenses that are incurred before your surrogate is even pregnant. So IPs are expected to pay for a will for their surrogate. That is vitally essential because in that will there will be a point that says that this child belongs to the IPs and not the surrogate. So if anything was to happen or anything was to go wrong the IPs would still have the rights to the baby. They would also need to pay for life insurance, usually for a two year cover. That will include just before the pregnancy treatment starts, during the IVF and during the pregnancy and for a short while after the pregnancy. Um, any expenses that are incurred during the get to know phase. So if you are meeting up, you're going out, you're having lunch, etc. IPs would generally cover that cost as well. In addition to that, you have then got all of the costs associated with any treatment or any appointments at the clinics. So that could mean loss of earnings if you're taking days off to go to those appointments, childcare whilst you're at those appointments, any travel or parking or lunch or costs that are incurred whilst you are at those appointments. There can also be fees for insem fees or medication fees and also for vitamins, pre-pregnancy vitamins and of course pregnancy tests. Also, in addition to that, some IPs use clinics that are abroad or that are really far away from their surrogates. So sometimes they have a choice. They will move their embryos to a clinic closer to the surrogate. If that's not possible, they will then incur the cost of sending the surrogate to the clinic and sometimes have to pay for flights or hotels in order for that to be able to happen. Once it's confirmed that the surrogate is pregnant, either by 
urine test, home pregnancy test or scans, whatever that is that you agreed in your original agreement that will be covered in another video, that is when the main bulk of the surrogate's expenses will come into play. Usually they will be paid monthly or four weekly at a set percentage, again, as agreed in your agreement. Now, what can be claimed for ranges massively and it depends on the surrogate situation and what the surrogate wants to claim in her expenses. So a main one is always loss of earnings. Loss of earnings can be a massive bulk of a surrogate's expenses. Not only loss of earnings for appointments and clinics and scans, but also for antenatal classes or if they are too tired or if they are too sick or in fact if they need to stop work early. This can also include loss of earnings for a partner or a parent if they are also coming around to help out, support, look after the children or pick up the slack where you haven't been able to due to the pregnancy. Childcare, again, can be a massive chunk of a surrogate's expenses for all the same reason as above. If you've got to go to appointments, scans, clinics, antenatal classes, you can't take the children with you. If you're too sick, too tired, need somebody to care for them, you are going to need a lot of childcare. Now, bearing in mind some surrogates don't work, some surrogates don't have young children, so they may not need to claim those expenses. This is why it's all individual to each and every surrogate. On top of that, we've got food. It may sound a little bit bizarre, but food, again, can incur quite a chunk of expenses. Not only are we looking at healthy food, you want your surrogate to eat right, you want your surrogate to have um, superfoods, extra fruits, extra vegetables, extra goodness, that can come at a cost. Also, convenience food. Again, if your surrogate is sick or tired or too fat towards the end of your pregnancy to be bothered to cook, you want her to be comfortable. And if you want to pay for her to have takeaways or she has factored those into her expenses, they are fully acceptable, not just for her, but also for the family that she would normally be cooking for. Maternity clothes, again, they may just be very simple. If you normally wear more labelled clothes or designer clothes, they may be factored into your expenses. Also, it could span two seasons. You could be pregnant through summer and winter or autumn or spring or however the seasons work. You may need clothes that are for cooler weather, clothes that are for hotter weather. Um, you may need new shoes if you're getting swelling feet. You may need a new coat. You may need lots of new underwear. So maternity clothes are always allowed as expenses. Alternative therapies are another one that can be claimed for. So this could be massages, this could be yoga classes, this could be relaxation classes, swimming. Any of those sort of things can also be claimed as reasonable expenses. Also medications. So mainly for me, Gaviscon. I go through bucket loads of Gaviscon when I'm pregnant. So Gaviscon would come in with your expenses, add, as would any creams or bio oils or pregnant care, basically anything that you're using because you are pregnant. Pregnancy aids are also included, so this could be TENS machines, birthing balls, breast pads, this could be pregnancy pillows, fans, anything that you are using because you are pregnant or to make your pregnancy more comfortable. Also, any travel that is incurred during your pregnancy, so to get to and from clinics, parking, travels, expenses, lunches, etc. whilst you are at appointments or attending appointments, whether they be at clinics, scans, hospitals, etc. Some surrogates will also claim for a feel-good factor. So if you are feeling really rubbish because you are pregnant, or you are losing your hair because that happens to a lot of women during pregnancy, you may want to pay to go to the hairdressers. Or if, for example, you are too fat because you can't bend down to reach your toes and therefore you need to go and get a pedicure because you can't paint them yourself, you may factor that into your pregnancy expenses. So it is all about what works for you and what you feel is a valid expense. Also, lots of home help can be included in those expenses. Things you would normally do yourself, but are now unable to do because you are pregnant, or you now feel uncomfortable doing because you are pregnant. So you may well have 
a window cleaner or a gardener or a home cleaner or maybe you have stables and you need a horse rider or a dog walker all of those things that you now can't do obviously either because of the pregnancy or because you're too tired or because you can't be bothered because you're too sick etc all of those again are reasonable expenses and of course there can be some treats within those expenses as well so whether that's thank you gifts for friends family parents or treats for your children because you've been a bit snappy or a bit moody or a bit tired and you want to treat them for a day out or some toys to keep them quiet while you rest that little bit longer they are also all included also to add in a hospital bag that is covered as well so anything that you're going to be needing to take to the hospital new clothes nighties toiletries etc anything you need for the birth would also be included in your expenses and at the very end you can also include a break for you and your family i'm not talking five star two week holidays in exotic countries but a small recoup break for the surrogate to be able to spend some time reconnecting with her family after the ordeal that she has just been through having a baby for somebody else. So as I said, they are not limited expense lists. They are just some of the things that are acceptable and some of the things that I know surrogates claim for. Again, some surrogates will, some surrogates won't. It is completely down to personal opinions and personal situations. No surrogates expenses are ever going to be the same. Of course, then we have anything that comes post-pregnancy. Now, some pregnancies and births are pretty straightforward and women recover very quickly. However, some do not. And that will again be in your agreement that you would have made right at the beginning of your journey. Don't forget, I will be making another video to go over the agreement and everything that should be covered within that. But post-pregnancy, there may be childcare issues to allow you time to recover, so they would cover that. Also, some extra comfortable clothes, especially if you've had caesareans or you've got, you know, scarring or sore areas where you need to rest and you need to be comfortable or you're not quite back to your normal clothes, but you don't fit your maternity clothes anymore. Also, maybe a weight loss plan, if that's what you've put in there. If you need to have a weight loss plan or a gym membership, that is perfectly acceptable. Support bands, sanitary items. Um, breast pumps if expressing or maternity bras so there are a lot of things post-pregnancy as well and also if you're unable to go back to work straight away and your maternity pay doesn't cover or your employer doesn't give you maternity pay IPs can sometimes contribute to that as well so as always don't forget this is all individual and the surrogate would have worked this all out and given the IP the expenses beforehand. So if the IP can't afford all of their expenses, then obviously the match is not suitable and they will be able to find somebody else. On top of all of this, it is also important to bear in mind that there should always be an emergency pot of money for any unforeseen circumstances. So for example, if your surrogate ends up with twins and there is a lot more care needed and a lot more expenses incurred, also, if your surrogate needs surgery, for example, after the pregnancy, or if they've got retained placenta or they've got any issues or hemorrhaging afterwards and require surgery, they may therefore need to spend longer in hospital than it fully was anticipated. And again, more time off work, more childcare, um, more costs involved. Also, if your surrogate loses fallopian tubes, fertility, ends up having to have a hysterectomy. There are a lot of things that can go wrong during pregnancy and birth. So they are usually factored in as well. So having an emergency pot to one side is always a good idea. Now, obviously we all know as surrogates, IPs do not have an endless pot of money, but it is also important that surrogates are not left out of pocket for going on this journey. So I do hope that this video has helped you to think of all of the different things that can be included as expenses, both from an IP's point of view and a surrogate's point of view. It could help new surrogates to put their expenses together and it could help IPs to understand where surrogates' expenses actually come from. Um, don't forget, if you've enjoyed this content, do subscribe to the channel. There will be following videos 
about printing orders, about agreements, about medications and lots of other things related to surrogacy. So have a lovely evening and I shall speak to you again very shortly.